Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, and as always, it's always a pleasure to see all of you. And uh, I'm always excited to address um, our foundation and the people that make the foundation possible. Uh, it allows us to do so many other things that a lot of libraries don't have the opportunity to do. Um, I'm coming up on my 11th year uh, here in Madison, and uh, I can remember my first year and how important the foundation was for this building that we're in today, uh, making that possible as well. And since then, there's been two other libraries and another one on the way. And uh, along that way, we've done some super innovative things. And uh, a lot of you are familiar with like the work of the bubbler, uh, the work that we've done with collections, particularly with youth, uh, making deliveries to home daycares. Um, those things wouldn't be possible, quite frankly, without the foundation's help. So, uh, before I share some breaking news, I want I want you all to give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> so, what's this breaking news? I, I just found out this morning myself. So, you'll be one of the very first. Um, I mentioned the bubbler by purpose. Uh, because that group's done a lot for our organization. And it's been a creative and an innovative force that wouldn't be possible without the support of the foundation. And it's expanded beyond just doing an artist in residence. It's really addressing social justice issues in the community. But um, earlier last week, we were contacted by the American Library Association and they asked specifically for our bubbler to do a presentation to a group of educators and librarians in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, thank you. <laughs> um, there's about a group of 500 educators and librarians that our bubbler team will be presenting to next week. And <laughs> I just thought, how cool is that? It's just one of those rare examples of your work, the work of the foundation, that has enabled us to build that reputation, to be able to progress to that level where they're calling us and saying, can you help this group? So amazing work. Thank you so much for, for your work and your contributions. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tanya Salman. I am a proud member of the Foundation Board, a uh, proud member of the Epilogue Circle, and a proud supporter of the Foundation and the Library. First off, thank you for coming today and for your support of the Foundation and our library. Uh, the support from you in our Madison community is what makes our library so special. So I thought I'd share a little bit about myself and why I support the library and intend to continue supporting the library as part of my estate plan. In 1990, my family and I were living in Kuwait. As many of you know, the summers in Kuwait are really hot. Uh, so it's common practice to leave Kuwait over the summer and come back in the fall once the temperature cools down. We had already been in Rochester Hills, which is a suburb of Detroit for a couple of months, and we're planning on heading back to Kuwait during the second week of August. But on August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and my family was stuck in the United States. Fortunately, my dad was able to land on his feet with a job at General Motors, and my mom was continuing to learn English by watching soap operas like Dallas and the Golden Girls. <laughs> As I grew up, and started going to school, I always knew I was a little different, a little, a little off, and the people around me knew I was different too. I mean, my dad's name is Montasim. That's my middle name as well. My parents have heavy accents, and for lunches, 
Uh, my lunches were always also a little different than everyone else's. Garlic heavy. <laughs> and as a kid, you remember those things. Being different. And at the time, I didn't appreciate the differences. I wanted to have lighter hair, lighter skin, have parents who weren't too shy to talk to the other parents because of their accents, and eat Lunchables like everyone else. <laughs> but I had a place where I didn't feel so different. Every weekend, my dad would take me to the library, and I could read. In the kids' section back in Rochester, we had bean bags and purple loungers. Oh. <laughs> Whenever I was there, I'd take a stack of my picture books, lay back, and then depending on the mood, either a bean bag or a lounger, and read. I got sucked into the Bears and Bears, where the wild things are, and anything shall silver see. As I grew up, the picture books turned into chapter books, and I was reading the Babysitter's Club, uh, Judy Blume, and Roald Dahl books. Anything that I could get my hands on. And then when I got my library card, I started checking out my own books. I started learning that how I was feeling, being different, was how a lot of first and second generation immigrants were feeling. I wasn't alone. <laughs> Libraries became my safe space. And when I really needed it, and when my family really needed it, they provided a sense of community for us. And I became confident in who we were. I felt much more comfortable with my own skin. I wasn't embarrassed of my parents. They were bright. They were heroes. I liked my dark hair. And my dark skin, you know, sunburn, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and I wasn't embarrassed about my lunches. Who doesn't wish they were loading up on garlic and hummus all the time? <laughs> and now that I'm in Madison, I have, and I have my own family, I have continued the tradition of library trips. One of our favorite weekend activities is to go to Penny, and we spend the mornings or afternoons in the library playing and reading books in the kids' area. And of course, we always come home with three or four more books to keep reading throughout the week. And so it's important to me that my kids, and all really the kids in the Madison community, no matter what is going on in their lives, have a safe space where they can devour all the books they want, learn about new things, and feel good about themselves and their own skin. And that's my personal story about why I support the library. And I've made the library part of my estate plan and it was actually very easy. I just put it as a beneficiary to my retirement account. Because after I pass, I can continue to contribute to our library in our community and make sure that any other little Tanias out there know that they have a safe space too. Thank you. Well, I shouldn't have gone last. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. I'm Connor Moran. I've stood at this microphone so many times, but this is the first time addressing all of you as Executive Director of the Madison Public Library Foundation. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, it has been five months since I took over as Executive Director, so most of what I'm going to talk about is actually stuff that our previous director, Jenny Jeffers, did. So if you have problems with it, she works best for Ryan Bob Foundation. <laughs> and it's great. I'm the future. Um, it is my nightmare to do a PowerPoint presentation. So I have slides, and I'm going to go through them for you. I'd much, much, much rather just have individual conversations. Um, and so I'm going to go through um, the report of how the foundation did in 2022. And then what I'd love to do is have some of those conversations at our tables. We changed the way that we uh, did our name tags today to talk about why we love libraries. Um, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Madison Public Library Foundation this year. Um, that comes up in July. The official date comes up in July. Um, and so we want to talk to all of you about what sparks your interest in the libraries, what sparks your interest in the foundation, where do you want to see us go. I can't commit to doing every idea that everyone has. I'm already wrapped up with Greg's Rindall idea. But <laughs> I, I really want to hear what motivates this group of people who will spend a after beautiful afternoon um, in here listening to us talk. So as I go through, please make some mental notes, ask questions. Um, Aaron Woodard and Katie Kaufman from my staff are also here, and so we'll join you and have some of these conversations as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, I always wanted Jenny to say, the state of the foundation is strong. <laughs> she never do it for me, so I do it. <laughs> uh, so here are my slides. Uh, we are Madison Public Library Foundation, as many of you know, because we are board members, donors, past board members, 
committee members, librarians. Uh, we exist to mobilize the Madison community to continuously improve, promote, and support Madison Public Library Foundation. I think last year and every year for the last 30 years we've been doing that. And we envision a Madison Public Library that is equipped with robust resources to deliver outstanding services, facilities like this one, and programs that meet the Madison community's needs. One note on that program, we did a lot of um, looking at statistics to put these things together. One of the best statistics that we found over the last couple of weeks is that 50% of all library programs are paid for by the foundation. That impact is the bridge between what the public and the private sector are able to offer. The public funds, funds, salaries, and any number of things, and many programs, but without you, half of what the library is able to accomplish in that community engagement in role would be impossible. So thank you for caring about the foundation. Um, I, I put up our core values. Um, these are values that we bring to all of our decision making, staff, board decision making, conversations with the library. Um, and I really want to just highlight our current effort with the Imagination Center at Rindall Park that embodies so many of these core values. The project at Rindall Park is really about reimagining the way our city operates. It's about engaging our community to both build a library for a portion of Madison that's never had one, allowing those people who live in that area to engage with the city in a new way, but also the library engaging with the city in a new way. So co-locating that building with Parks Department, listening to Greg talk about how he's gonna get us building permits uh, desk there, or any number of other city agencies will have a place that they can set up shop and work on and ways that the library can then work with other departments in the city really does have a new vision for what the city can be and how we can provide services to people. Um, I keep saying it, and I can't quite believe it. I met with Trip Witter, who many of you know, uh, for coffee yesterday. And I asked Trip about when he got started with the library, and it was 1998. And I said, oh, you're the person to talk to. That's the last time we built a new branch library. We have not built a new branch in our library in 25 years. It was Alicia Ashman Library in 1999. It's the last time we expanded the number of libraries we have. This is the first new library of the 21st century, and I'm so excited to build it with all of you. That is one of our core values. That is leadership, that is integrity, it is championing what is best for the library, and it absolutely what is best for the community. Um, this year is all about building literacy. Um, building literacy no longer just means helping people learn to read. It means helping people navigate um, their way through the world. So we navigate the way through the world definitely by reading. Um, you can see we had almost two million materials checked out as a library. Um, that's physical things, digital checkouts put us over two million uh, for the year. Um, we also pulled out this Canopy video place. I don't know how many of you know, but the library offers a streaming service um, for free. You can watch 10 movies or TV shows with your library card absolutely free, and I cannot tell you enough how much Madison loves this service. Um, from when we piloted it early last year to now, we've had four times the amount of people using it. Uh, I was just talking to someone last night, and their teenage daughter like popped out of the other room and was like, I can watch things for free at the library? And then she was already well into the movie by the time we left her dinner last night. <laughs> Um, we also build literacy through programs. Um, your donations, $918,000 worth of donations last year, uh, was up almost double over what it was in 2021. Um, largely this is because we had programs that we could fund. Um, you may remember 2020, we didn't have any programs. Um, but these, the following slides show just how um, some of the programs that you funded through your donations helped build different types of literacy for our community. Um, so one of the things we do is we read and play. These are colorful, durable play materials available at every library. Uh, this builds social literacy by combining social development, play, and early reading literacy into a singular type of child learning experience. You can see this happening with children in every library where they're, they go over here and they play with the little foam, these foam stackable things, and then they come back and they read with their you know, caregiver, and then they go back and they interact with the, some, you know, little wall, and then they come back and they do check out, and that is exactly the kind of thing that Tani's talking about, where you build lifelong learning and literacy through engaging with children in the spaces. 
Uh, we also do arts literacy and health literacy. Um, this program that you're seeing right here is the memory book workshops we did with the Bugler Artists in Residence, Angela Johnson. Um, these programs build health literacy by offering free programming uh, based on health and wellness for BIPOC communities and communities of older adults. What you're seeing here is their memory book workshops, which allow them to engage in actual memory building and memory uh, kind of saving activity. Uh, we saw many people who then use these as gifts to future generations in their family where they were able to tell stories through art and then uh, pass that on. Uh, making justice, we heard about from Greg. Uh, he stole my punchline. I was going to talk about Kazakhstan. So, uh, but this builds art literacy by engaging with incarcerated and at-risk teens in a generative artist-led mural and space creation project. Uh, making justice works with children uh, across the um, criminal justice system here in Madison. Engages them. Are you asking what that is, too? I'm asking what the word after the word light is. Time. It's a lifetime, not a lifetime. Um, but they work for these students um, who are in juvenile detention or jail or in the sheltered home. They created a mascot that is an umbrella mascot for these places. These students are taken out of their um, traditional learning uh, uh, schools. And then while they're in this place, they develop this identity together. And they're not, they don't feel left out. They don't feel left out of where um, they were learning. They graduate. Many of them choose to graduate as uh, the the mural isn't shown here, but they chose Panthers. So they graduate as Panthers, um, and they see this, these people who, across years and years and years, they, they form this identity together. Um, it's an absolutely incredible program. I'd love to talk more with you about it after. Um, and then other things, like coffee at Penny. This is a, a gift for Miriam Simmons just envisioned. What if we had coffee in the library once a week and people could come and just talk? And so we're building social literacy by offering library patrons a spontaneous and many uh, opportunities to connect and socialize with other people who love the library. Um, the things you see are people who don't know each other coming together, talking about why they love the library, and then coming back the next week to make friends with these people that they didn't know two, three weeks ago. Um, we, we do these programs. These are just four of the things that we offered out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of programs um, that you've helped make possible. Um, I also want to just mention your donations led to $1.1 million in grants for library programming last year. That number's a little higher than normal. As I mentioned, we didn't have programs very, very much in 2020 and 2021, so we were able to hold on to those uh, gifts that you made and give them to the library last year to make an absolutely huge impact, $400,000 more last year than in 2021. Um, your annual grants support all sorts of things. Um, they support collections, which are incredibly important. I don't know how many of you know, but our library is the uh, reference library for the entire system, which means we have to buy certain types of uh, materials so that all the people in the library system benefit from that. It might mean that maybe your kid can't come in and get the new Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and they have that somewhere else because they didn't have to buy the obscure economics book. But it's really important that we have that as a resource because we provide it for the entire South Central Library system. Um, we also funded Staff Day, which allows the staff to come together from across all nine branches, um, gather, learn from each other, cement their strategic vision and goals, um, and focus on things that make librarians uh, time working in the libraries better. It sends uh, people out for professional development opportunities. Down here you'll see Holly Storkpost and uh, Tammy Ocampo, who went to the Guadalajara International Book Fair, where they acquired new titles for the Spanish language collection here, um, connected with authors and publishers um, who focus on that. The next slide is about mini grants, which are smaller based projects, often pilot programs, or um, programs that don't fit into the city budget. Um, so that can be something like the Staff BIPOC Affinity Group, showing off the cards that they wrote to BIPOC seniors for the holidays, Events like Library Takeover, which expands uh, who gets to use the library as an event space, something I care very much about, um, and allows the real community impact on what they want to see happen in their library. And we teach them how to use the library, how to plan the event, and they invite different people to use the library. It really opens up um, the doors to who can, who can do this. Have you ever heard me talk about those kinds of books before? Um, I do love the book festival. It has grown so much over the last 10 years, thanks in major part to many people in this room, Mark, Levy, uh, 
as our signature sponsor and many others. Um, last year we gave away 3,600 books directly to people for free for attending the Wisconsin Book Festival. Um, that was an increase of 33% over the year before, and I think putting books in readers' hands supports the work we do in so many ways. It supports our audience, it supports our authors, it supports independent bookstores, and it drives people who want to come back. Um, we had 79 events for just under 30 people under 12,000 attendees last year. Um, and to put that into context for you, those 79 events were about 2% of the total programs that went on at, across the library system. It amounted to 19% of the total program audience for the library system. The impact of having incredible authors for free in these spaces is undeniable, and I can't wait to watch what Jane does with it in the future. I wanted to talk about endowment funds. Our endowment funds allow us to know that we're going to be able to do this great work long term. Um, we have an endowment for each library. Um, we have an endowment for the library system. We also have endowments for other types of collections and internships. But it really allows both the foundation and the library to know that we can set a strategic goal and we can accomplish it over time. We don't have to worry on the individual level about whether that grant's going to come through or whether you know, someone needs to support something else or the market has a bad year. Um, it, this is really, really important. Um, so one of the things we do as we build a new library, we will build an endowment for that library that will help it operate. Um, I would love to see an endowment for the Wisconsin Book Festival that would do the same thing. Um, and I love to think about um, the epilogue circle as a real strategic way to help us build those endowment. All of those gifts go into our endowment um, and they happen long after we're able to make those decisions. And so I want to thank everyone who's a member of the Epilogue Society who's here today. Um, I'd love to encourage all of you to think about plan giving to the library. Um, as you make your estate decisions, and if you have any more questions, please ask me about that. Um, and my good news, Greg, was going to be that I was going to share a picture with everyone. This is a map of our current libraries. This is the first time that we're going to show this picture of the Imagination Center at Lot Randall Park. Just today we finished the map design. I can't believe it. Um, and we're able to start talking about what the library is going to look like. I, really, really love that you can absolutely tell what this building is. <laughs> um, so we're going to break out a little bit now. I know it's just about 5 o'clock, so if people need to leave, I certainly understand. Um, but we'd love to join you at your tables and talk about what you'd like to see from the next 30 years of the Library Foundation, um, from the library going forward, what keeps you connected, what made you connected at the beginning. Thank you so much for coming. Please drink the wine so I don't have to take it back to my wife's wine store and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>